Hello everyone, my name is Rupa Sunku and I'm the Chief Evangelist at Touch a Life Foundation. I bring to you an episode of Career Elevations, an opportunity to listen to some successful people and hear their journey as well as their paths to success, giving you an opportunity to learn of their experiences and adapt it to your own success. So I am super excited to introduce to you Shrini Madala. Hi, Shrini. How are you? Uh, hello, Rupa. Uh, very good. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. So let's start off by asking you, what are the things that you are accomplishing in life or doing today in your business and additional activities that uh, keep you busy? Wonderful. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I'm uh, just as always. I've been involved in entrepreneurship and uh, pursuing business. So right now, I am running two companies. Uh, one is Aquila Systems, which is in the for addressing insurance fraud, and then uh, other one is Softso, which is an IT company. And uh, uh, I spend a lot of time also with my personal foundation, but other charitable trust in India, and as well as other philanthropic things that I do here. And a good part of time I spend with my children. Uh, I really like to hang out with the young kids, and you know, so that's what that I is do. so fantastic. It's like a little quadrant happening in your life with uh, four yeah. important pieces that you're juggling and enjoying yeah. at the same time to give you a very fulfilling life. I'm sure. So yeah. tell me a little bit about the fraud protection company that you've got. How did you come up on that idea, and uh, yeah. when did you get started on that? This is a new one that we started about a little over four years ago. We uh, realized that there are a lot of things that changed in the last twenty years, and uh, you know, uh, technology, especially, you know, has come a long way. And uh, the changes that occurred in the last five years is a lot more than what happened in the last fifteen, twenty years. So. That is combined, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that being said, uh, fraud is an ancient industry, you know, uh, ancient yes. profession. I would say, you know, whenever there's money, there's influence, and there's power, uh, there is likely to, you know, be uh, scope for fraud. And uh, uh, the fraudsters became a lot more sophisticated with time, and and uh, so is the advancement of technology. So, uh, what we realized five years ago was. Uh, you know, when one of our customers we were working with uh, realized there was a significant amount of fraud and they actually won a court case, uh, but they were unable to produce the amount of uh, damage that was caused to them. It was a, an ironical situation where, you know, you, you won the case, but you can't even quantify and document how much you lost and why you lost it. And that's a wow. so that's when we realized that there's a need for the tools and other things to assist in fraud detection as well as uh, um, you know, both identification as well as uh, you know conviction of uh, fraud. Awesome, awesome. So it draws me to the question. Often enough, we start off our careers or our next path after uh, finishing our primary education. We mm-hmm. tend to go into the field of uh, whatever we've studied because that is our skill set. But later on during our life, experiences or uh, knowledge or uh, events in our lives kind of make you get into the business or get into a profession that's associated with that. Uh, So tell me a little bit about your educational background and uh, how did you get into building software and making philanthropy your milestones or backsplash? Right. So Rupa, you actually brought a very interesting subject. So I answer in two parts. So sure. one is, you know, uh, uh, to basically restate what you just uh, mentioned. And second thing is uh, basically how it applied to me. Right. Mm-hmm. Personally, I, I believe that we're a lot more than what we study or go to school for. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a simple thing, but people realize it. Some people realize it sooner. Some people realize it much later in their life. So in, in my case, you know, I I, I was I wanted to become a doctor, but I actually became a, an engineer. Then I was offered <laughs> <laughs> admission in electronics and communication engineering. But then I was probably the only guy in the college history to switch to mechanical engineering simply because somebody said you will get a job easily if you go to mechanical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> then I ended up being an industrial engineer for masters. And then 
uh, and then actually pursuing a software job. Uh, I hardly coded for a year or two, but then I became a business person, but don't do programming or engineering. Mm-hmm. So that's why when my children, you know, uh, want to do something, I never really tell them what to do because I, I realize that, uh, you know, all these degrees are labels that we attach for the time being. Or, mm-hmm. or, uh, and sometimes people try to get fall for it and try to pretend like because they went to college for certain things, they should do the same thing. And, and that's where it actually raises a lot of conflict internally and also adversely impacts their performance. So, yeah, that, that's what uh, I, I feel in my case, though. I don't know if I really wanted to do business, but I, re- I really, really craved financial independence more than anything else for, right. you know, for simple reason that I just felt like, um, you know, uh, not having financial independence would, would pretty much bind me to eight to five at, to be at the command of my job or my boss, whatever that may be, what my profession. So, and then me starting a business that that was just a pure, uh, a simple thing. I, I, you know, I just got married, and uh, uh, people start telling me, and because I got married to a doctor, then I need to work hard to make equal money as <laughs> he does. It wasn't really true, but that time, that's how that people used to say that to me. I know it's funny now, but that's what it was. Uh, but that wasn't, I simply wanted to be with my wife uh, because she wanted to do the residency and I wanted to be wherever she is. Uh, and, you know, it's such a silly, simple reason. Uh, so I, I started, I felt like in, in, no matter which job you were in, uh, you can't be wherever you want to be unless you have your own jo- company. So that's right. how I started it. Uh, but, you know, yeah, it's interesting how it, I ended up doing business. Fantastic. So uh, you were talking about not really enjoying coding and not having done coding for too long, but now you run a software company. So what are some of your guiding principles in terms of hiring uh, people to this uh, organization? And how do you utilize, obviously, your previous experience and academic uh, portfolio to kind of uh, look at your software company in terms of um, working with it and uh, building it up? I don't know if there's a simple, straightforward answer or or more logical or scientific answer for this, but all I can say is, uh, in in general, you know, uh, it's organized common sense more than anything else. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you learn by your experience and your understanding that what it is like to solve a problem. Uh, And then you try to find different alternatives and different sources of resources that you can get and leverage upon, and, and that's how you go about doing it. When you when you start small and and every time you know, start up or things like that, you try to draw upon something sources that are close to you, and then when you scale, you try to go out more organized and uh, you know uh, professional ways of uh, you know using resources or hiring things like that. Perfect. So often enough, when you go into entrepreneurship, it's about raising money to support your vision, your passions, and uh, build out the so-called product company that uh, scales and sustains the marketplace. So any thoughts on how you were able to delve into that space coming from an engineering background and probably not having too much awareness of the financial sales marketing side of the house. So um, basically, when, you, when, you, when I first started the company, my first company, you know, pretty much I was everything. Uh, you, you, mm-hmm. know, you were the salesperson, you were the secretary, you were you know, everything. And then as you start growing, you learn some things as well. Interestingly, my, my, you know, uh, my first company, which I still keep, although it's the same name, but we actually morph into a variety of different things that we did under okay. that umbrella. Uh, so at the time, it was so, uh, things were different. So I was able to bootstrap and continuously grow and, and make it happen. Uh, but my uh, same thing with the new company, the Aquila, for example, is funded by this other company. So that's how we're doing it. But uh, at some point, um, it's only recently in the last, you know, uh, later on in life there, I, I recognize the value of uh, uh, investments and things of that nature where you quote investments and, and grow. But at the time when I first started, I, I wasn't really aware of it. First, second thing is, personally, I, I was more inclined towards uh, running a closed corporation where, mm-hmm. where it was uh, m- more like, you know, not having to deal with, you know, investors and 
uh, VCs and angels, things like that. Uh, okay. And but I realized that there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, what people should do is uh, entrepreneurs should really pursue what works for them, mm-hmm. uh, and more than one simple, straightforward way of doing certain things. Because nowadays, uh, I, I see a big hype about you know finding a pitch, try to pitch to somebody, and mm-hmm. quoting investors. I mean, mm-hmm. I understand that there's no doubt about it. But not every business has to be of that of that type. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the biggest and best industries exist without having to raise money from investors. Wonderful. And first thing. Second thing, not every company has to, you know, build, grow and sell it to somebody or take it public. You know, there, there are non-profit organizations, um, you know, AAA is a non-profit, NFL is a non-profit organization, right. Kaiser right. is a non-profit organization. So mm-hmm. there are so many ways, many times people have the standard way of thinking just like when I was growing up, there was only two paths, like medicine or engineering. Everything mm-hmm. else is made to believe like it wasn't the right profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my advice is, you know, if, if trying to get an idea and pitch it and try to get some money, this is not your style. Don't feel bad about it. There are multiple ways of pursuing entrepreneurship and you should explore all those, whether you want to uh, run a small company, medium company or large organization, uh, for-profit, non-profit, or otherwise. Amazing. That was just so enlightening. Even to me, listening and seeing multiple entrepreneurs and uh, people around me, or uh, my own experience working for Oracle, a big giant corporation, I think those were some wonderful ideas and uh, alternate thinking methods that you've shared with us, uh, Srini. And I also really like the other piece that you shared with us is bootstrapping as you go along. Yeah. Uh, so you can pick up the things that you need to research on and get it going for yourself, for your own company and your corporation. So you've got a lot of vested interest and maneuvering or uh, bootstrapping, as you said, adding to what needs to be done to survive and to grow and to achieve. That was just beautiful. You know, the way you shared it and the simplicity of your thought process was uh, definitely great um, a set of ideas for people to think about. Fantastic. Let's go over to your third quadrant. So that is your philanthropic work. So how did you get started on that? And what is your uh, basic principles around philanthropy and uh, paying your way forward or paying it back to society or the community? Well, wonderful, Rupa. It's a nice question. So, you know, uh, I was always, you know, I had this philanthropic inkling from the very beginning, but it, it all began with... Uh, uh, I think it all, what I call in life are points of inflection, certain mm-hmm. things that influence you a lot more than others. Uh, you know, typically, you know, when I talk to people, I don't forget to mention that uh, these points of inflection, one is uh, the college that you choose sometimes, uh, maybe your first job and, 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 and the spouse you get married to, you know, and, and so, these are some of the points of inflection I call and mm-hmm. there could be others for other people. Uh, in, in my case, I think uh, personally, I believe that my wife is a lot more philanthropic than I am. Mm-hmm. And, and she would tell me to go be very philanthropic. <laughs> and it, it's, I think, a little different than the standard stereotypes of spouses where people are supposed to tell you not to spend money or not to give <laughs> <you the> money. <laughs> I had a different scenario. So uh, anyway, that's how we started. So we... I initially started with, uh, you know, a hospital that we that thought we never have a need to go to that particular place. Uh, but right. we, we gave a contribution, significant amount of it. It so happened 10 years later, then my father-in-law needed a kidney transplant and then we ended up going there. But at the time wow. we contributed, we had no idea we'll ever use that hospital. Uh, and then you know, I, I'm a firm believer in what is called as charity begins at home. So... Yes. If you can take care of yourself first and then your children, your family, and then your friends and neighbors and your village and your home, it doesn't go anywhere. So we basically implemented the same thing. You know, we, we started supporting significantly the entities that are close to us. Mm-hmm. So the local hospital, the local school, our kids went to school. And then the village that I, my grandparents, you know, were there and I... Uh, and we do have Madala Charitable Trust in, uh, you know, in Varni, in the, my grandparents' village. So you can see that. So basically, that's how we, we did it. And now I realize that it's more important is 
the time. So what happens in entrepreneurs and, and Silicon Valley professionals as well as other people as well nowadays is uh, they're so busy building yes. their careers and creating wealth and uh, promoting entrepreneurship. In the process, the one resource that is very scarce is time and time has to give somewhere. So what they do is they try to cut the time where people don't make a big deal about, which is the, basically the family or the mm-hmm. children, uh, our health. And then and 20 years later, 30 years later, they realize that when they look back, you know, then they, they can't really have a connection or a communication with the children because they have nothing in common or health is deteriorated, stuff like that. Uh, so what I realized was, uh, this was about 10 years ago, uh, as I was started doing philanthropic things, including I was on the board of some nonprofit organizations and stuff like that, I realized that I, I was spending the, the exact day when my, my son has something in the school, uh, I, I have a board meeting somewhere for a non-profit. <laughs> then I realized that this is not right. So I basically cut down. So now what I do is I pursue my non-profit activities aligned with spending time with the family. For example, mm-hmm. my work that we do, we have foundation in India. Every time I go to India, we have a foundation in our uh, grandparents' village, which we did. But that's also that's something I spend time with my dad and my nice. uncle who are 80 years old or something like that. So basically, I am, and then my son goes to UC Berkeley, but I'm a mentor in UC Berkeley, not related to his class, but something else. But it gives Thank me a chance to go have lunch with him. You know, <laughs> I, this is, these yes. are the kind of things I'm doing right now. And I encourage uh, other people to do the same thing because uh, you, you keep chasing your goals. That's wonderful. But you lose these things. Uh, but there's a way to balance these things together. If you're and that way, I'm close to my family at the same time. They get to appreciate, for example, my dad is 86. He gets to appreciate what we did at the foundation or, or what he wants to do, actually. I'm facilitating mm-hmm. to make it happen. But most people try to contribute and do all these things when the parents are all done. They're passed away and on their name, they do something about it. What good does it do if you do it at that point? Such a wonderful expression and a very different perspective to consider. And I think you highlighted a couple of things for me. One is time is also paying it forward. It does not have to be monetary uh, work and help, even like your mentoring or doing it in the ecosystem that your family is in to be able to be part of that whole celebration and the giving process is definitely some really good aspects or concepts to think about. And there's one, one more thing I like to add, if that's okay with you, is absolutely. Uh, many times people, I see a lot of parents telling the children what to do, what not to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they keep on repeating it to so much to an extent that they irritate the kids and they alienate them. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I believe is children are very smart. You, you can tell them 100 things, it doesn't matter, but they observe what you do. Yes. So if you actually are doing these philanthropic things in a nice way, in a, in a way that, man, that gains their respect and trust, then you kill two birds at one shot in the sense that you don't have to tell them what to do. Very uh, true. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, it's always good to, and at least it worked for me in my case, uh, sometimes it looks funny in the sense that, you know, your professional peers, they don't understand why you don't really show up in a bunch of these things. But it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong way. You need to have your conviction. You just do what is right for you. Absolutely. No, I'm, I can relate to that uh, tremendously because I am at a point where both my children have left the house. And they are uh, engaged with their own activities. And similar to you, my son is at Berkeley and my daughter is doing her um, uh, doctorate in physical therapy right here in the Bay. This gives me an opportunity to do things that are close to their heart. And I have also vicariously lived through all of their high school work and volunteer time. So I started learning more about uh, the society we live in, not where we were raised and born, because often enough we reflect back our uh, default to some of those learnings. And that's not right or wrong, but it's also about learning the new horizons that you can avail and see around you. 
Fantastic. I'd like to kind of uh, draw on you to share a message with our listeners on how you have overcome some of the pivots that you've had to take or the difficulties or obstacles that you've had to face in life. Uh, you've given us such a different uh, perspective on all three or four topics that we've talked about. So I'd like to hear from you. How do you untangle yourself and come out of obstacles as well? So, um, you know, uh, whether it's entrepreneurship or profession or in general, the life itself is is is, uh, is like a marathon. Uh, it's not a simple sprint, uh, sprint kind of mm-hmm. thing. And then there are, it's like a, any any other thing. There are good and bad, there are ups and downs and stuff like that. And, and uh, oftentimes people are treated by, you know, their intellect and their uh, energy and stuff like that. The most important, you know, I guess trait I, I would say, uh, that is useful and uh, valuable is perseverance. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to have lots of uh, tenacity and perseverance to deal with these things. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to express it in some kind of significant, forceful way, whether mm-hmm. it is by your actions or by thoughts or things like that. But more importantly, it's by being able to deal with the pressure and and deal with uh, and have that resilience. In my case, <laughs> what I do is usually when when things don't work out. And and you feel like you know when it when things happen things happen in all directions together and it, it's just so hard to deal with it. Sometimes in everybody's mm-hmm. life you, you run into those situations. Uh, when all all else fails, I I just go to simple thing called heuristics in the sense that logic doesn't work, formulas, calculations, algorithms don't work. You just go with the rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. So simple thing is it 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 can't go wrong very badly. What is the worst case scenario? <laughs> and what is the best case in that, in that right. sense? Uh, and, and then it, it makes you feel a little better. To give an analogy, I mean, you know, even the big Boeing, for example, if you want to crash it, it simply doesn't crash that easily. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, for example, childbirth is a good example. You know, so many things have to go right for a child to be born healthy, right? And then you saw in lots of prosperous affluent families in civilized countries, People go through all kinds of medical tests to make sure that the child is born properly and still things go wrong. Yet, there are so many poor, indignant families who are, babies are born on the street and still healthy. Yes. So, so you know, really, so what I'm trying to say is you, you can't really mess it up, you know, you know, and if you really want to as well, because <laughs> that's how it is. So, it, yeah. it, we, we, by nature, things are like that. So, you, you should not really get scared and I like to think that way and then it just makes me feel better. So I know it's so silly uh, analogy maybe, but that's what my thought process is. But um, to give a simple technique though, you know, uh, every time I I was a jogger, I I run. uh, And and throughout my life, ever since I was in my sixth grade, anytime I was uh, under stress or anything, uh, physical fitness, uh, and right now I may do yoga and other things, but uh, running actually helped me to maintain my sanity. Right, right. So it all, I always, no matter how stressful I was, uh, I run, I come back, I just feel good about it. There were times when I was in the U.S. or starting my company, you know, in, in the U.S. It was snow, Christmas time. Uh, I went for a run, I came back. Uh, I was still okay, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, each one will have their own way of doing things. But I think you you kind of deal with it through physical and, and mental techniques uh, right. I would say physical part is you choose what works for you. In my case, it was running, jogging, you know, it helped me a lot. And now it's yoga. But uh, the mental one is really it's your family, friends, support system that you have, uh, you know, is really that goes a long way. And, and these are the two things. And then if you don't have one, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, vicariously or some other way, you could kind of make a connection with somebody, yes. you know, uh, that could give you that connection. It could be religion sometimes. It could be whatever that 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 works for you absolutely i think uh, in all of this that you shared the other thing that i'd like to speak about is the self reflection that you do going back to that basic where you know the basics cannot go wrong 
That's there correct. is basics of math, there's basics of nature, there's basics of uh, human life and existence at large. So going back to the basics and taking out all the noise that's probably confusing you at that point in time brings out the ability to unravel and come out of that difficult situation. Okay. Excellent. I mean, I am so impressed uh, with some of the very simple yet powerful messages you've shared with us today. Is there any Anything that you'd like to lastly close out uh, our talk with our listeners? I'd like to say the same thing. I, as I just reiterated, um, you know, you, you pick what, what you value the most mm-hmm. in, and then you stick to it and it works very well. In, in my case, uh, I, I really like, I, I never considered myself an entrepreneur. I never considered myself a successful person. In my, my definition, success is when I'm 70, 80 or 90 years old, uh, I, I sit on the porch, uh, porch and, and just glaze into the sky and, and just think of my children and grandchildren, how much they accomplished and how they feel about me. And I just keep smiling without any reason. In my Beautiful. definition, that is my definition of success. So everybody can have their own definition. I don't judge them. And this is my definition. And finally, I, I, I will not like to close it without acknowledging my my daughter who is the youngest ophthalmology resident in the country she just nice. started her residency today uh, this year actually and um, she has done philanthropy academic success and everything together and still the, i give credit to her because she's very balanced she's happy and and she loves me wonderful that is such a great tribute and uh, your dreams of sitting on the porch and gazing into the sky has already begun for you. So congratulations you. on that. Thank you once again, Srini, for joining us. Thank you once again, everyone, and talk to you soon. 